Now in the book of Acts, chapter 13, we're going back here. We notice that they, they end up going back to, um, to Antioch. So it starts off in verse number 1 saying, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean. Man, that, that church at Antioch must have been great. In those early days, that must have been a great blessing to be a part of that church because there's so, I mean, it lists off so many of these great men of God were there, they were teaching and preaching, and a lot of exciting things were happening in Antioch. And it lists off a bunch of them. But um, it says here, look at the, verse number two, it says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So here we see Barnabas and Saul are being chosen out of this group. By the Holy Ghost. God is making a calling on their life and saying, I want these two men to go. They're going to depart from here. They're not, they're no, they were teaching. They were doing all kinds of good work in Antioch. The work they were doing was great. But God's saying, you know what? I've got a different calling for these two men. I want you to separate them for me. It says in verse number three, And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Now, I've preached on this before, but... You know, everybody in church is going to have a different role. We're all going to have different functions. Now, we all ought to be serving God. And you all ought to be listening to what that calling. Because God has a plan for every single person. Now, he lays out here his plan for Barnabas and Saul. But that doesn't mean he didn't have a plan for everybody else that was meeting in Antioch. Because he does. And God, God calls certain men. He, he, he ordains pastors and preachers and evangelists and teachers. And all these different types of people. And it's important for us as Christians that we need to have our ears open. Have, our, have our, our, our minds and our, our eyes on God's Word and have your hearts open listening. What is it that God wants you to do with your life? How does God want you to serve Him? Because He wants you to. He, like I said, He's got a plan for everybody. And His plan specifically for these two men, He said, the Holy Ghost said, hey, separate me, Barnabas and, and Paul. I've got a job for them. I've got a work that I've called them to do. They're no longer going to be teaching there in Antioch. I need them to go. And look at what they do. This is interesting because we, we can't forget this... Um, this ordinance or the way that things were done. I don't know how things are done in every church, but I know here that like when I was sent out to pastor this church, my sending pastor laid hands on me and preached and gave me or you know, uh, sent me out to start this local church here. And I believe that that's how local churches need to be begotten, that you know, pastors are sent out and that these people have callings should be sent out where it says they fasted they prayed. And they, I mean, we, we've lost fasting in, by and large in, ma in many people's lives. I mean, so many people, it's just a foreign concept to even think about fasting. Like, wait, fa what? You want me to not eat? <laughs> I mean, we live in such a rich country today that even the concept is foreign. I mean, God has blessed us so much. I mean, you, <laughs> we're th we throw away food. I mean, you eat, you eat three meals a day, if not more. What, I mean, basically, you have enough food and abundance to be able to just throw food away. And, and this is so foreign to what the way things used to be for a really long period of time. We just happen to be in, in a God-blessed time where we have these things. But fasting should be, I mean, a lot of people fasted because they had to, <laughs> let alone fasting for, for God or fasting for, for a purpose, you know, that would involve prayer and really getting yourself humble and really, you know, um, denying yourself in order to get in touch with God. But this is what they did. This is they fasted and prayed. And don't just read over that because it's, it's always easy to read over verses. And this is one of the reasons why we go through verse by verse on Wednesday nights is because we don't want to just read over stuff. It's easy to look over these things. They fasted, they prayed, and then they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. Now look what, look what ended up happening. When those men did that, when those men fasted, when those men prayed, when those men laid their hands on them, verse number four says, so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost sent them forth. Those men were filled with the Holy Ghost when they fasted, when they prayed, when they prepared. They laid their hands out and said, okay, God's got this calling. We're going to send you out. And they were in complete obedience to God's word. They heeded the calling and they did it. The Holy Ghost, the Bible says the Holy Ghost sent them forth. Now, I just think that's really interesting. They departed and they continued on their work. See, they didn't, God didn't want them just planted in one place. It's a really good place to be. I mean, it'd be really cool. Who doesn't want to be surrounded by all kinds of great teachers and pastors and just a great church, a, a thriving church, doing all kinds of great work for God? But God said, no, I need, you need to go out and, and do some more work. We're not done here. You're not, you're not going to get comfortable here. right? And oftentimes when God calls you to do something, it's not going to be comfortable. But you've got to be willing 
to be able to, to put yourself out there and, and, and just be obedient to God's call and say, you know what, I'll just do it. And, um, and God will use you. And I mean, God, look at how much God used Barnabas and the Apostle Paul. It's amazing. I mean, he did all kinds of work because he was willing to give up his time, to give up his life, to give up whatever it was that he could have wanted in this life to be able to devote it to the Lord. And the Lord used him greatly for that. Now, God has a calling for you. And I believe that every single person here, God has a calling for you. But the question for yourself is, are you willing to answer that calling? Are you listening for it? And are you willing to answer it if you do hear it? Instead of just, just putting it out of your mind. And it might be something that's um, not going to be comfortable. Maybe it's going to involve some sacrifice. In fact, it probably will involve some sacrifice. But you have to be willing to give up whatever it is. If God's calling you, answer that call. Now we're going to jump down. This is a huge chapter. I'm not going to be able to get through every single verse tonight. And there's so much stuff to, to cover. We're going to jump down here. Look at verse number 6. Just a little, just a little ways down the chapter. It says, And when they had gone through the isle into Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now, I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to park it here a little bit on this false prophet. Okay, we're going to explain it. But turn, if you would, please, to 2 Peter chapter number 2. Keep your finger in Acts 13. We'll be back here. Turn to 2 Peter chapter number 2. We're going to learn a little bit about false prophets tonight. It's an important subject, and I know I've preached about this before recently, beware of false prophets, but it's important that we beware of false prophets. Uh -huh. And it's coming up here, there is this false prophet, we're going to learn a little bit about, about their devices and what they're trying to do, and they're sneaky and they're cunning and they're out to deceive you. So we're going to look at 2 Peter chapter number 2, we're going to learn some of the attributes of a false prophet and what the Bible tells us and what the Bible warns us about false prophets. 2 Peter chapter number 2, start reading verse number 1, it says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. First admonition, look, there's going to be false teachers among you. Just get, just get used to it. There was a false prophet even in Jesus' church. Even among the 12 disciples, you had Judas. I mean, of all the, if you were going to think that there's one place where you're not going to have any false prophets, it would be under Jesus. But even there was one there too. And um, we need to just be aware of this, be on guard. Okay, we'll keep reading here. We'll learn a little bit about them. It says, there, Even as there shall be also um, be false teachers among you who privily, that's privately, they're sneaky about it, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Verse number two, And many, many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So here, you have people, you have these false prophets that the way of truth, what they, what they end up doing is they drag Jesus' name through the mud. They take the truth and it says the way of truth is going to be evil spoken of because of what these false prophets are doing. This is where you have those perverts that are going out and these pedophiles that are in positions of a pastor or a preacher or an elder or a deacon or whatever in these churches, these false prophets that are out there and they defile little kids and because of their pernicious ways, because of the things that they're doing, they're bringing evil upon the, the, the word of truth. I mean, people will say, oh yeah, that Baptist church that had, you know, I'm never going to a Baptist church again, and it's because of some, some infiltrator, because of some false prophet that gets put in this position, and you need to watch out for it. We just need to be aware of that. This is their devices. They're going to come in, and they bring to themselves with destruction. Look at verse number three. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. My friends, the love of money is the root of all evil, and these false prophets have very easy way to spot them, or one way to spot them at least, is their covetous attitude right. and, their, and their greed and their love of money. That's right. And they'll make merchandise, it makes me merchandise of you. They're not just out to make a buck like an honest way, like you know, start a business and, and just try to make money that way. They're going to make merchandise of you. They don't care about it. They don't love you at all. They'll do whatever they can to make merchandise of you. It says, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Let's jump down to verse number 12, 2 Peter chapter 2. It says, but these as natural brute beasts. Brute means stupid. Okay, they're, they're, he's referring to these people as stupid animals. Made to be taken and destroyed. So this is like, this is like an animal... You know, like when back in the day when you know a dog would get rabies or something, it would just be a stupid animal. You just have to put him down. There was no hope for him. You just, you just have to just made to be taken and destroyed. And what he's likening these false prophets to are natural brute beasts that are just made to be taken and destroyed. 
that there's, there's no hope for them. They're reprobates as they speak evil of the things that they understand not. They don't understand the Holy Scriptures. They don't get it, but they speak evil of them. And they shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Verse 13, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings. Look at this. While they feast with you. Again, another warning saying, hey, look, they're going to be among you. While they feast with you. While they eat with you. Look at the next verse. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. Now look, these people, these are not your average unsaved person that he's talking about here. This is not Joe unsaved down the street that we're knocking on their door and you know, they just haven't heard the gospel and you know, they're living their life, a regular worldly life. These are wicked, evil people. They have eyes they can't even cease from sin. And they infiltrate and they get in. And, they're, and they're, their goal is to do damage. Their goal is to do damage to the, to the cause of Christ. They're going to feast with you. They're going to put on a show. They'll put on the outward appearance. But inside, they're full of dead men's bones. That's what Jesus Christ referred to the Pharisees as. You see, yeah, yeah, the outside looks great. But inside, you're full of dead men's bones. And, and it's an open sepulcher. And these are the people you need to look out for. Now, you're not always going to be able to spot them either because they put on that show. They're common. They're deceivers. They're out trying to deceive you to do their ultimate damage and their ultimate goal of, of bringing damage unto the church, unto the cause of Christ, and even just unto people in general. They're out to hurt and destroy. It says beguiling unstable souls. People who are unstable, maybe a new believer, maybe a young child, people who are unstable, they're not, they're not founded in the truth, they're not founded in God's word. They're out to try to deceive. Those are the people they're going to go after. That's why you find these child blessers, these perverts, and these false prophets, they're always trying to attack the children or trying to attack people who, who don't know much or they have a lot of hardship going on in their life and they're struggling and they're just unstable. Those are the people who are going after because they're seen as weaker. And they're going to go and attack them viciously like a roaring lion. Just like the devil, the roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. And these people who are children of the devil are doing the exact same thing. That's right. It says, okay, in the same verse 14, Beguiling unstable souls, in heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. These people are cursed. They're cursed children. And I don't, I'm going you know, to hit that point right now. I've just brought it up about them being a child of the devil. Don't take that lightly. And we're going to get to this back in Acts 13. We'll get, we're going to come back to it again. When you, when you hear the phrase, when you see the phrase a child of the devil, again, so I've heard some people say before, well, before you're saved, you're a child of the devil. I don't believe that to be true. The same way that I also don't believe that not every single person in the world is a child of God either. The Bible says, but unto, uh, unto them that, um, but to them that received him, them gave you power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. So the same way that when a person gets saved, when they put their faith in Christ, they become a child of God. They become a son or a daughter of God. And that is a permanent bond. That is a permanent relationship. You can never change it. Once you have God as your father, he is always your father. He will always be your father. The same way my daughters in natural life, you know, God gives us these examples. He uses this terminology and his words so that we can understand what he's talking about. My daughters will always be my daughters no matter what they do. No matter if they commit the worst sin in the world, they're still my daughters. Likewise, when someone is a cursed child, when they become a child of the devil, when they have, have pushed things to the point with God where they become reprobate, and Romans 1 decides we're not going to go through Romans 1 tonight, when they become a child of the devil, they're cursed. And this is where you see, because you look at people, you think, how can they get so depraved and so perverted and do things that no normal person would ever even think of in a million years? It wouldn't even cross your mind once to do half of the things that these extremely perverted, wicked people do. It's because they're cursed children. It's because God has given them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. God has taken that hold up. Their conscience has been seared with a hot iron. They have nothing holding them back from their wickedness. And it's funny, we just, we just found out today about that, about that bill, about the, the homosexuality or whatever. And you know what makes me sick? It's not that they vetoed that bill or whatever. What makes me sick is that we're even having discussions about like, 
the, the level of acceptance of homosexuality in our, in, our, in our country, instead of having a discussion of, hey, let's get back to Leviticus 2013. Why don't we just do execute judgment and, and make our laws in this society based off of the way that God ordained his laws? God viewed it as something that is punishable by death. And today we're talking about, well, should we discriminate? Should we let them marry? Let them marry? Let them marry? They deserve a death penalty. Just like, what, what do you be saying? See, and, and this is what's ridiculous. People don't understand this. People don't understand the level of wickedness with this sin. Nobody would seem to have a problem if you were discriminating against a mass murderer, right? Or just a murderer, right? Someone, someone who just kills people in cold blood. Would you say, would it just really be that unfair to say, well, I don't want to serve that person in my business. I don't want a murderer coming in to my, you know, to my place of business. I don't want to serve that person. I don't think people are going to have that much of a problem with it. Well, that's someone that deserves a death penalty the same way that homosexuality does, the same way that adultery does. Adultery, yes. Adultery in the Bible also is a crime that's punishable by the death penalty. And that's something that's just completely accepted today in our wicked, perverse generation. We need to get away from this. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm getting, I'm getting off on a rant a little bit because that, that, that this whole nonsense in the politics is, is disturbing me. But, but getting back to the false prophets, I don't want to lose focus of the false prophets. They're cursed children. Okay, these people are reprobate concerning the faith. They cannot believe. Look at verse number 15 of 2 Peter chapter number 2. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray. They knew the right way, but they've forsaken it. These people have heard the truth. They know the truth. They've, they've, they've forsaken the right way. They've gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. Verse 17, excuse me. These are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. These people, the same way if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit that seals you unto the day of redemption and you're, you're sealed, you're bought with a price. These people have the mist of darkness that's reserved unto them forever. Verse 18, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. These false prophets, again, beware, because they're going to be, they're going to be coming at you making sin not be that sinful. They're going to be saying, oh, it's not that bad. Oh. When it's talking about why Jesus turned water into wine, right? I mean, it's okay to go out and have some drinks. Hey, Jesus did. He, he brought them. They had well drunk and Jesus got them more wine. Baloney. When you understand wine is not talking about a, a fermented alcoholic beverage that Jesus gave to them. There's no way in the world Jesus would give a bunch of people who are already drunk more booze. Because he wasn't giving them booze. He was giving them the pure juice, the pure blood of the vine, um, and that type of a wine. But here's the thing. These type of false prophets, though, they're not going to preach like that. They're going to tell you, sin's not that bad. It's okay. Hey, we're in the age of grace, brother. Everything's fine. You know, we don't got to worry about that Old Testament stuff. We're, we're free from the law. Don't worry about those rules. This is what the false prophets are going to do. And you know why they do it? Because it allures the people's flesh. People like to hear it. Nobody wants to come in and hear, wow, well, you mean what I'm doing is wrong? That doesn't feel good. Now, you know what? We should want to hear that. I want to hear that. I want to hear, hey, you're doing something wrong because you know why I want to be able to change that and get right with God. But by and large, people don't want to hear that. It, it has a tendency to drive people away. So what the false prophets do in their love of money and their lack of love for the people in the pews or for anybody for that matter, in order to make merchandise of them, they're going to tickle their ears. They're going to say, hey, this isn't so bad. This, you know, oh, you guys are doing just fine. Everything's great. Come on, sit down. We're, we're having a great time here. We're worshiping God. Go on, go on. Keep living the way you're doing because everything's just fine. And this is what they do. They promise them liberty. Yeah, you guys are free in Christ. They themselves are servants of corruption. They're servants of sin. They're not free from sin. For of whom a man is overcome, the same is brought into bondage. Verse 20. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world... Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them 
than the beginning. Turn back to Acts chapter 13, if you would. Because here we see, we're talking about a false prophet, okay? There's, there's other, you could look at the book of Jude, 2 Peter chapter 2, you know, they deal with false prophets. You can learn a lot about them. We need to be aware of them. They're out there today. They're in full force, out trying to deceive people, beguiling unstable souls. Watch out for them. They're wicked. They're out to destroy. And we see here, we're going to see in this story, this man, this um, bar Jesus, or Elemis, was a false prophet. He's labeled here as a false prophet. Look at verse number 7 which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man. So here you have, you have Bar Jesus and Sergius Paulus, right? And they're, and they're, you know, they're hanging out together, whatever. They're, they're together. But Sergius Paulus says he was a prudent man. And he called for Barnabas and Saul, and he desired to hear the word of God. So Sergius Paulus, he, he wants to hear God's word. He's calling. He said, yeah, bring, bring me Barnabas and Saul. Hey, I want, I want to hear what they have to say. I want to hear about God. I want to hear this stuff. Look at what, look at what the false prophet does. Look at what he tries to do. Verse number... Eight, but Elemas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. See, he cannot stand. He does not want anybody to get saved. He does not want anyone to hear the gospel. He does not want anything of God to come to fruition. He's there as a, as a, as a servant of the devil to try to just turn as many people away. And he's going to withstand you. The false prophets out there, they're going to try to withstand you. They're going to try to deceive these people. I'm sure he was trying to deceive Sergius Paulus here when he hears the gospel, when he hears the gospel preached. And this is something that if you're a soul and if you're going out trying to preach the gospel, you're going to encounter this. You're going to encounter people who are going to try to mess up that situation. You finally get someone, they want to hear the gospel. You're thinking, oh, great, you know, I'm going to get a chance to talk to this person. And then that... that Worker of the devil is going to come up and try to say, nope, nope, get in the house. I don't want you talking to them or whatever it may be. Now, it's not always going to be a false prophet when some of these things happen, but, but it will happen sometimes. And, here, and this is one of the reasons when we go out and knock on doors and go soul winning, we like to go two by two. And here's something, if you've, if you've never done this before, one of the reasons why we go out in pairs and by twos, and one of the reasons why one of the person is a silent partner is that if a distraction walks up, the other person that's with you that's not doing the talking can go and cut off that other person at the pass so that to buy you some more time if they were going to come up and if they're just a devil, if they're just someone that's going to try to mess up this person hearing the gospel and getting saved. That's one of the good things that a, that a silent partner can do is to go and just try to prevent that from happening. And that's one of the reasons why we go out in pairs and, um, and do things the way that we do them. So um, if, you know, in case you're new to soul if you haven't gone out, if you've never heard that before, it's something that you could keep in mind when you're going out with somebody else and you're preaching the gospel. Hey, just, just be aware of your surroundings. Think, Because oftentimes I'll be talking to someone at the door and then someone will pull up in the car. And it's great if you have someone else there to go, hey, try to give that person the gospel. Anyway, I mean, even if they're not there to try to mess anything up, amen, we'll get another person saved. You know, I mean, try to give them the gospel. But oftentimes I've had people, you know, they'll come up and they just don't like the fact that you've got a Bible in their hand, in your hand. For whatever reason, they don't like God, and you know what? They don't want anyone else to hear about Him either. I've had people tell me before where, where sick relatives were about to die, and they knew me. They knew I'm not going to keep my mouth shut, right? And these are people that I know, too. And they'll say, don't, don't talk to them. Don't, don't talk to them about, about the Bible. Don't talk to them about God. It's like, and they're, they're unsaved people, but they're saying, you know, they're saying, because they know that if I know that much, if I know, hey, I'm going to make it a point, like this person has cancer, this person, you know, like, like I'm going to, I'm going to dead sure make a point that, that if I haven't talked to him before already, and even if I have, I'm going to talk to him again. I'm going to talk to him about this. This is important. And they'll, and they'll try to, they'll try to say, no, no, you know, people are going to be against you. There's a lot of people that don't want to hear that. And dead sure the, the false prophets, like this Elemis, is going to try to do everything in his power to, to get you to not hear to, not, to get people not to hear about Jesus Christ and to turn them away from the faith. And um, this reminds me too, in, in Matthew 23, the attorney, you have to turn there. In Matthew 23, Jesus goes on this tirade against the Pharisees and the false prophets. And um, in verse 13, he says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. So he's saying, look, Yo, you, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, 
You're not going in yourself, and you're also preventing everyone else from going in. And this is what the false prophet's going to do. This is what Elymas was doing. Now look at um, verse number 9. It says, Then Saul, who also is called Paul, I'm going to make you know, a brief mention here. This is the last time in the book of Acts that Saul is referred to as Saul. From here on out, you're going to see his name is just referred to as Paul. So if that's confused you going on, because I know when I preach, I'm so used to calling Saul Paul just all the time. And I'm sorry if, you know, as we're going through the chapters. But from here on out, when I call him Paul, it's just going to be completely accurate because at this point, it's no longer Saul. So um, I just wanted to point that out. This is, this is the chapter that we're in where that happens. And then it says, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. So he looks upon Elymas. He looks upon his false prophet says, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. So that brings back, he calls him a child of the devil. We've already gone through and explained that. And thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And this is what the false prophets do too. They don't come up with a completely different way that has nothing to do with the Bible or nothing to do with the law. What they do is they pervert the right ways of the Lord. Of the Lord. That's how they try to make it acceptable. That's how they get their foot in the doors. They say, oh, but I believe the Bible too. Hey, we're worshiping the same God. You know, I, I believe the Bible. And this is, I mean, that's what the Mormons will tell you today. They'll say, we believe practically the same thing. Over and over, they've been like trained to tell you that. Is that we're, we're, we're pretty much the same. We, I, I believe the same way too. You know, I'll say, oh, you, you read the King James Bible too? Oh, yeah, so do I. You don't believe it. Not even we're close to the same thing that I believe. What they do, though, they take the gospel, they take the gospel of peace, they take the Bible, and they'll twist it. They pervert it. And they make the truth into a lie. Now, they try to make it look like the truth. They try to make it look like, hey, it's a good thing. No, they twist it. They pervert it. This is what the false prophet does. And like I said earlier, it's not your average unsaved person. So don't, don't just go around thinking like, like, False prophet and just be like, all these unsaved people are all they're all false prophets. No. This is a certain designation to people, a very small percentage of people in the world, um, I believe, fall into this category, being a child of the devil, being a false prophet, being someone who is has this type of a wicked heart, this type of a just just gone off the deep end um, reprobate. But um, one more one more instance, I was going to, in John 8, again, you don't have to turn there, stay in, stay in Acts 13, but um, we're well, almost done with the false prophet thing. In, in John 8, 42, Jesus said unto them, it says, if God were your father, you would love me. Because, see, the Jews at the time, the Pharisees were claiming that they were of God, that God was their father. So we'd be not born of fornication. You know, God's our father. He says, if God were your father, you'd love me. You know, the tree is known by its fruits. And that's what Jesus is explaining here to them. Look, you would love me because I am from God. He said, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. So if you truly were of God, you would know that I'm of God also. And you'd love me. You wouldn't hate me and go about to try to kill me. He says, why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. So these people, they were claiming to be children of God. They were claiming to be children of the Lord. But Jesus said, and he said in verse 44, ye are of your father, the devil. He said, you're not, you're not children of the Lord. You're children of the devil. He says, in the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. And these are the same people that were also murderers that put Jesus Christ to death because they're of their father, the devil. Now, let's continue on here in the book of Acts. Let me get off the, uh, the false prophet thing here. Look at verse number 12. It says, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, so it, just to bring up the speed real quick, you know, um, look at, we'll read verse number 11. It says, now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. So Paul is, is telling us, you know, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Verse number 11, and now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. Sound familiar from, uh, from 2 Peter chapter 2, a mist and a darkness? And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. So, so Paul sees this guy and he and he he rebukes it. He attacks it. He says, "No, you're not. You're not gonna you know mess this up. You know, full of all study, all mischief." And he's telling him, "No." So this guy's blinded. I mean, I mean, Paul's just speaking through the Holy Ghost, and this guy's blinded. He can't see anything. 
So now he's basically done away. So then we see in verse number 12, it says, Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed. And look at this. This is, this is interesting. Because you might think that, like, well, he saw this. I mean, this guy is blinded and all this other stuff. He believed, but it says, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. The doctrine is a teaching. It doesn't say he was astonished that, that Elymas was blinded. He was astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And remember, he wanted to hear about God. He wanted to hear from the beginning. He wanted, he, he wanted to hear what they had to say. He was astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And he got saved. He, was, he, he believed. He put his faith in Christ. It says here he believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. So, um, you know, don't let these false prophets, you know, get, you, get these people away from hearing the truth. Just, just stand up to them. The Bible says, resist the devil and he shall flee from you. Don't let them, you know, walk all over you and, and talk loud and just, and just get you to turn tail and run away. Stand up. Have the boldness of the Holy Ghost. You're going out preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Don't let these people turn you away and, and, and try to prevent people from getting saved here. Let's keep reading. I'm going to jump down. It says in verse 13, Now when Paul and his company loose from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So here they lose John from their company. He goes back to Jerusalem. It says, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets and the rulers of the synagogue, the, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, You men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So they go into a synagogue, you know, get yourself in the store here. They go into a synagogue and sit down. And after the reading of the law of the prophets, they say, okay, hey, you guys are here. Do you, you, know, do you want to come up? Do you want to preach? Do you have anything that you want to say to the people? So they get up, and, and he starts, and it's always, it's always cool that um, when they preach the gospel, you see the Apostle Paul and Peter, and you see, they're going and, and trying, to, trying to win over the Jews to Christ. They're trying to preach the gospel to them. They are always bringing up Old Testament scripture. I mean, that's what they had. That's what they knew. And they're, they're bringing it up and saying, look, Jesus Christ is the fulfilling of the prophecy. Jesus Christ is the way. Now look at, um, he kind of goes through, he says, the God of this people, in verse 17, God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people where they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an high arm, so he goes through, you know, saying how they were, they were in Egypt. God, you know, brings them out with a high arm suffers their manners in the wilderness and, you know, destroys the nations to be able to give them the promised land, to give them the land of Canaan, divided their inheritance by lot. And it says, and after that, he gave them judges. So he explains, you know, they had judges until the time of Samuel. And then they get a king, Saul, the son of Sis. And then, um, you know, he replaces. So he's kind of going through this history, right? It's a real brief overview of the history of, of, of the, the children of Israel and what happened to them. Um, throughout the Old Testament, he's really breaking it down, just, just covering it real fast. And we see here where it refers to David as a man after God's own heart, uh, which shall fulfill my will. Look at verse 23. It says, of this man's seed. See, he goes through this real quick synopsis now to bring it to Jesus Christ. He says, of this man's seed, of God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. He brings it all the way up to David. He says, okay, of David's seed of the house of David, because that's what the, the prophecy was, that's what the Old Testament Scripture said, that of the seed of David, of the house and lineage of David, was going to come the prophet, the Messiah. And he, sa and he says, G this is where Jesus came from. Verse 24, When John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Verse 27, For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. So he's saying, look, at Jerusalem, you know, the Jews there, they, they had... Um, you know, they have the prophets read to them every Sabbath day. But they weren't hearing them. They didn't understand them at all. They slain them. They fulfilled the prophecies in their ignorance and not even knowing the scriptures and not believing what the prophets were preaching, what, you know, what, what the Bible was saying. 
which were read every Sabbath day, they fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. He's explaining this whole story of Jesus Christ now. He gets into a lot more detail. He gave the brief overview of the, the history of Israel and then, and then goes into depth now with Jesus Christ because he's preaching to them the gospel. He wants them to be saved. We're going to skip down because he goes through a lot of just prophecy and stuff, but I don't, we don't have that much more time. So look at, um, jump down to verse number 38 if you would. Or verse 37 it says, But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, brother, uh, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. He makes an unequivocal statement here that your justification is not coming through the law. Because the Jews at that time, and even the Jews of today, have this problem where they think that their justification is in their obedience to the law, and they're, they're obeying the commandments, and how well they are, and how good they are. Like, no, that is not what gets you saved. Your justification, you're going to be justified from all things through Jesus Christ, from which you could not be justified by the law. And the law of Moses doesn't justify you from those things. The law of Moses condemns you. You need to be justified through Jesus Christ. That's why it says all that believe are justified from all things. Every single person that's a believer in Christ is justified from all of their sins through Jesus Christ. You cannot be justified by the law of Moses. And this is Paul again. He's preaching the gospel to these Jews and he's in the synagogue. It's obviously salvation by grace through faith. He's preaching this to the Jews. And then the same message for the Jews is the same message that he was going to preach to the Gentiles. The Gentiles then asked him, you know, um, in verse 42, jump down real quick, it says, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So they said, hey, we want to hear this too. You know, preach this unto us. And uh, verse 43, it says, Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So, you know, so people believe. People, they heard the preaching, they heard the preaching of Christ, and they believe. Verse number 44, it says, And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. That's amazing. I mean, all, almost the entire city, it says, come together. This is the work that God had called them to do. They're making a big stir. And you know how they're doing it? With their doctrine. The same way that Sergius Paulus was astonished at the doctrine, they came with the doctrine of Christ. That's right. And Jews, Gentiles, I mean, they had, they had the whole city come together. I mean, would to God we could get that kind of a turnout <laughs> for an event like this. I mean, these guys were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, they had a lot of men before them doing all kinds of work as well. And there's no, no small stir of what was being done in those days. And you know what? That's what we're going to do today. That's what, what our goal is, is to make no small stir in this city and in as many cities as possible around the country and around the world to just do as much work for Jesus Christ as we possibly can and get people to hear the doctrine, get people to know the doctrine, and to come and to want to hear the word of God again. Verse 45, it says, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things, which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. So at first they weren't so bad with it. I mean, they heard them, they suffered, they let them, they let them teach and stuff. But then it's like, they see these big, these big throngs, big crowds of people, and all of a sudden they became envious. They didn't like what they had to say because they didn't like that they had this, these crowds showing up to hear what they had to say. And that's just sad. I mean, it's just sad that they were filled with that type of a spirit where they just, they just got envious. Don't ever get envious of, of another church. Don't ever get envious of what other people have. I mean, just envy in general, obviously, is a wicked sin. But these men were doing great things for God's glory. It wasn't for their own glory. You'll never find the Apostle Paul just glorying in himself. He's always giving God the credit. He's doing God's work. They were called to do this work. Don't be envious because people are listening to him. Don't be envious of the preacher that's doing God's work and he's doing a lot of things and doing great work for God just because he's got a lot of people listening to him or he's got a big church. Praise God for that. But don't, don't, don't have this attitude where you start speaking against those things and you just have to start attacking them now because you're jealous because he's got this big church. You're like, oh yeah, and you're going to start nitpicking at something that you think is wrong in the church. That's wickedness. Don't go, I mean, look, 
If you got someone like a Joel Osteen that's got a big church, but they're a false prophet and they say all kinds of wicked things, yeah, go ahead and rail against them. Go ahead and call him out for what he is. But when you got a man of God doing God's work who's getting a big crowd, don't go attacking that person. Don't go trying to bring him down. Don't go with speaking against those things and contradicting and blaspheming like they were like the Jews were doing here. Hey, praise God. Be a part of that work. <laughs> if nothing else, but don't don't try to bring him down. Don't get full of this envy. If you if you have that full of your heart's in the wrong place. Because you ought to just be praising God that God's getting so much more honor and glory and, and getting so much more work done. Verse 46 says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So he says, look. And this has kind of been the case in, with the Apostle Paul and what he's been dealing with. And going, excuse me, going to the synagogues and, and teaching to the Jews and trying to get them saved and bring them to stuff. And he just says, look, we're done with you. Now we're going to the Gentiles. And um, verse number 47 says, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And again, so he's not just doing this out of spite. Paul's not just saying, I go to the Gentiles out of spite. He says, For so hath the Lord commanded us. He's still, he's still doing what God said. He's, he's not just saying that and doing that because he's now upset because they're attacking him. He's saying, well, look, this is what God commanded us anyways. You know, we're done with you guys. We've been, we've been trying to, to be patient. We've been trying to work with you. We've been trying to show you the truth. You keep on rejecting it. Hey, God said to be a light unto the Gentiles. And that's where we're going to go. And they're going to hear us. Verse 48 says, And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained... To eternal life, believe this is going to be the last major point that I'm going to get into here because this is a verse where it's very so often misunderstood by people who think it's a it's a Calvinistic doctrine that people who think that you're you know predestinated or God or, and, and here's the thing I want to be careful with my words because the Bible uses words and, and they're true and they're accurate and yes these as many as were ordained or eternal life believe absolutely amen but it's understanding what do those words mean. Does that just mean that God is up in heaven and saying, you know what? Saved, not saved. Saved, not saved. Saved, saved, not saved. And just, and just picking at will and at random who he wants to be saved and who he doesn't. That, my friend, is, is a lie. That is a falsehood. The Bible says the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come under repentance. The Bible says that, see, and let's, just, let's look at this a little bit. And try to understand this word. Because it's really not that difficult. But when somebody gets in your head, and this is the problem, when someone gets in your head and tries to twist you around on things, that's when you start seeing, that's when you start thinking like, oh man, how? and you start being maybe confused and thinking like, how does the Bible say this? I, I didn't think, you know, I, I, you know, when someone's just getting in your head and just, and just putting these, these thoughts in there, you start seeing things differently. But it's really not that difficult. As many as were ordained to eternal life believe. Look, Excuse me. Turn if you would to Romans chapter eight, because we're gonna go, we're gonna look at this a little real quickly. I have predestinated and ordained the eternal life. <clears throat> Essentially, what the verse is saying that. Essentially, what it's saying is that as many as receive eternal life believe. But um, we're going to see here, because I'm going to cover predestination real quick in Romans chapter 8. Look at verse number 28 of Romans chapter 8. Then we're going to go to Romans 9 next, and we're going to jump back here. But um, Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. And people will turn to this and say, see, God chooses who's going to get saved and who isn't going to get saved, because they focus on that word predestinate. 
where God has predestinated you before. You didn't even have a choice in it. God's already predestinated you to be conformed to the image of his son. But here's what they're missing. They're missing the very first phrase of verse 29, for whom he did foreknow. See, God has foreknowledge. God's outside of time. Something that's hard for us to understand is we're stuck in this, in this time continuum. We only understand things in, in, in the way time works. Okay, in, in, in the past, the future, the present. This is how we think of things and see things. God doesn't, even have, God doesn't have that restriction. God knows the beginning from the end. We haven't experienced it yet, but whatever it is that you're going to do next week, Assuming you're still around on this earth, God knows what you're going to do. He knows it. Now, because he knows that, does that mean he made you do that? No. Absolutely not. He's not forcing your will. He's not forcing your decisions on what you're making. He knows them. So here's the thing. If God knows that one day you're going to put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no issue with being predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. He foreknew this. See, the first thing is for whom he did foreknow, then he did all these things. He knew in advance. God knows. He's outside of time. He knows these things. He predestinated you to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And, you know, again, it goes on from there. And they'll follow this train after the predestinate. Then, you know, then he also called. And whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. But the thing is, it's just because God knew in advance. It's not because he made the decision to make you believe or that he, he just wanted you to, to be saved for whatever reason that he decided and someone else not to be. And he just made us robots and just, and just dictates every last thing that happens on this earth. See, foreknowledge does not equal no free will to choose. It just means he knows in advance. It would be like, I mean, an example of foreknowledge is this, right? I could watch my daughters, I could watch them start climbing up onto a chair. I could watch them start leaning over the back of that chair. You know what? I know what's going to happen next. <laughs> I didn't make them do any of that. But I know before it even happens what's going to happen. I know that chair is going to fall over and they're going to crack their head and they're going to get hurt. That's what foreknowledge is. But it doesn't mean you make it happen. And it's exactly the same thing with God. See, God foreknows. Now, he'll predestinate you if he knows that you're already going to, you're already going to make that choice on your own. Sure, he'll predestinate you. But make sure you don't get that, that confusion. Now, look at verse number 9. because or, I mean, sorry, chapter number 9, verse number 8. Because this is where... I've gotten in discussions with people that are really just hardcore Calvinists and is trying to tell you that, you know, God picks and chooses. And again, when, when you go down their line of thinking, they can throw you for a loop sometimes. If you let yourself just, just, just kind of get wrapped up in, into their head, into the way that they're seeing things and you let them, because what they'll do is they'll pick and choose certain words or certain aspects and really magnify that to start making you doubt or question what you believe. But it's, it's when you take the full thing in context, like Romans chapter 9, we're start looking at verse number 8. It says, that is, they which are the children of flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Romans 9, 9. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also hath conceived, excuse me, by one, even by our father Isaac. And this is the key verse that they'll point at. I'm trying to get a little bit of context here. They'll say, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And here's the thing, for understanding this, on, on face value, it might be easy to get, to get confused or turned around about this. But you have to know the history. You have to know, first of all, anytime, here's a little tip. Anytime you see in the New Testament quotations from the Old Testament, go and look them up and read them. And that will help. If you, don't have, if you, if you look at this and be like, I don't really understand this that much. What is he talking about? First of all, go back to those locations in the Old Testament because that's what we're going to do tonight to help you understand this just a little bit. You can't just ignore that, that he's quoting the Old Testament here. You have to understand what he's saying. 
Because you see, they'll, they'll take this verse 11 and say for the children being that, see look, they weren't even born, they didn't even do any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that call it. They're saying, see, God just chose everything in advance. He didn't even do good or evil. And then they'll, they'll, they'll jump down to verse 13 and say, see, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And that's what they'll, that's what they'll, they'll, that's what they'll do. They'll use that and try to and say, see, God chose Jacob to be saved and Esau to be damned. When they were in the womb, they didn't even do any good or evil. This is, and this is the logic they'll take you on. But let's see what he's really saying here. Because you, it's, it's really important to go back to these, these, these Old Testament scriptures. Genesis 25, 23, this is what verse 12, okay, I'll read verse 12, says, It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. This is the first Old Testament reference. Genesis 25, 23 says, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So there you have that last phrase, the elder shall serve the younger. What is the rest of that entire verse talking about? Is that talking about specifically the person Jacob and the person Esau? Not at all. Two nations are in thy womb. Two manner of people shall be separated from the bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people people. The entire context, entire verse is talking about two nations, two groups of people, not two individuals. Okay? So when he, when he goes here in verse 12 of Romans 9 and says, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. First of all, this is talking about two nations. And th it, it makes sense because if you think about it, when did, when did Esau ever really serve Jacob anyways? In, in the entire account in Genesis, of, of Jacob and Esau. You know, they get split from each other for a while. Jacob earns, you know, earns a good living and he makes a good wealth. Esau does the same thing. Esau is also blessed. Esau also has a lot, of, a lot of goodly things, right? Jacob comes to meet Esau. If anything, if anything, and I don't believe this is either, but if anything, you could say Jacob was serving Esau because Jacob came back and he's sending all these gifts forth and he humbles himself. He says, look, if I found grace and I sight, you know, like, don't be angry with me. I'm here. Have all this stuff. Have all these gifts. Nowhere in the, in the book of Genesis are you going to find where, where Esau is serving Jacob. It's obviously talking about the nations that are going to come out of those two people, out of Israel and out of Edom, because that's what Esau is Edom and Jacob is Israel. And those are, those are the two nations that, are, that come out of those two people, the, the, the progenitors. And then it says in, in so verse, that was verse 12. Now verse 13, if you want to know where that's coming from, that's from Malachi chapter number 1. Malachi chapter 1 is where it's referred, referring back to Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Because you look at that and say, okay, well, I mean, he's talking about two people there, right? The, the, the man Jacob and, and the man Esau. Let's see what Malachi chapter 1 says. Look at verse number 2 of Malachi chapter 1. It's the last book of the Old Testament, right before we get to the New Testament. Malachi chapter 1 says, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. So there you go. But let's keep reading. This is where the quote's coming from. And laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom, so here we see the, the reference to Edom, which is the nation. That's, that's the whole country. That's the nation of people that came from Esau. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Again, we're referring to a nation, we're referring to a group of people. This is not talking about choosing individual salvations. It's not even talking about salvation. It's talking about a, a, a whole nation of people, a whole group of people that, that God hates. And, and ultimately, it is because of their works. It's because, of, because they were living in wickedness and sin. And um, so don't let this... Don't let this Calvinist garbage turn you around and, and twist your view on God because 
they'll like to use these words, like this term sovereign, a lot. And again, you've got to be careful with, with the words that people use because they'll, they'll try to, they'll, they'll use good words or they'll take good, you know, words that have a good meaning normally, but they twist them. And they'll, they'll say that the word sovereign, and watch out for that word sovereign, because anyone who's throwing this around, you can just, it's like, yeah, you're a Calvinist. I mean, that's, that's all I'm at what they're saying when they start using this word all the time. Sovereign. Because what, they, what you think that word means is probably going to be different than what they think it means. What they mean is that they think that basically that God's will is always going to be done no matter what. And when you really start to think about it, it's a, it's a very twisted view of God. Because if you're thinking that, that when all of the wickedness that happens in this world is, be, is God's will, that these things are happening and it's because, well, everything that happens, is, it's just God's will. That's a pretty disturbing thought about God. That is not the way. I mean, the Bible already just defeats that when it says that the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We know that's what God's will is, but he's given us a free will. It's not dictated by him. Now, he, he's telling us what he wants us to do, but it's up to us to obey him. It's up to us to listen to him. And it's also dangerous to think that, well, God's will is just going to be done because what it does is it gets people lazy in preaching the gospel about Jesus right. to think that, oh, well, you know, if I don't give this person the gospel today, someone else will do it. God will make sure that they get someone else to preach the gospel to them. That is, my friend, that is not true. Now, God might try to get people to do it, but you know what? It's only going to be based on what are you willing to do, what are they willing to do, what is someone else willing to do. There's a lot of people going to hell today because Christians have dropped the ball. They didn't listen to God's calling on their life. They didn't listen when God's saying, look, I want you to preach the gospel to every creature. They just, they just ignored it. They think, well, God will just make sure it happens. No, my friend. God's not going to make sure it happens unless you get off your rear end and listen to what he's saying and do what he has for you to do. Because God has made this a teamwork effort. He's, designated, he's made us ambassadors for us. He's made us the, the mouthpiece, the human instrument. In Christ said, we need to, to convince people to be reconciled unto God. Christ isn't here doing it for us right now. It's up to us. He's committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation, of getting people reconciled unto God. God uses us. Yes, it's the Holy Ghost. Yes, it's God doing the saving. But he needs us to go out and do it. And without us, he's not going to do it on his own. We've gone through this with the book of Acts and many other chapters, but I can't hammer it down enough that we have to be listening to what God's call is on our life, and we have to be listening when he's telling us to go out and do these things, because it's not just all going to be okay. God's not just going to necessarily make everything work out. It's up to us. We need to fill the gap. We need to step in. Thank God for people like Moses who... who let themselves be used by God and was able to get a whole nation of people saved, saved from bondage, free from bondage, because he was willing to stand up and do that. But when God's looking for a man to stand up, stand in the gap and fill a hedge, and if he doesn't find any, guess what? He's not just going to do it himself. That's right. Bad things are going to happen. He needs people to stand up and say, you know what? Here am I, Lord. Send me. Here am I. Use me. God needs us. We need Him. But God needs us to get His will done. It's not just going to happen. Let's finish off this chapter real quick. I'm uh, my marker. Real quick here. Where will we leave off? We're on... Uh, I'll write down at the bottom here. So let's, let's keep reading here. Verse 4 9, The word of the Lord was published throughout all the region, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. So to see, the Jews, they, they couldn't stand it. You know, the Lord, the word of the Lord was published. I mean, they're out doing the work, but they just they couldn't stand it. So what they do, they raise up the devout and honorable women, you know, the people who, who had clout in the society, people who were well respected, and they say, we're going to get these guys to cast them out. You know, we'll make some laws against them or whatever. We're going to get them out of the land. Verse 51, now this is, this is a great this is attitude that we have, but they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came an Iconian. Don't let it get you down. 
Hey, you're getting expelled out of a place. People are kicking you out. People are throwing you out. Don't let that discourage you. Kick the dust off your feet, I guess. Say, oh, fine. We're going to go over here and people are going to listen to us over here. And we're going to cause more trouble over here. <laughs> and then verse 12, 52, I'm sorry. It says, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. And I'll tell you what. When you answer God's calling and you're truly doing what He wants you to do, it will fill you with joy. You'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will provide you with that joy. And if you're doing what He has laid out for you to do, it's a, it's a joyful life. Now, does that mean that it's a persecution-free life? No. People are going to be coming at you. People are going to come against you. But you can still have joy. And, you might think, and that's probably why we're, people think we're crazy. Because they say, how can you have so much happiness and joy when you're going through so much hardships and troubles? It's the joy of the Lord. It's the joy of the Holy Spirit. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this chapter. God, I pray that you would please just um, help us to beware of the false prophets that are out there, dear God. Help us not to be deceived by them. And help us to just, just be aware of their devices. You've given us so much information, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just, just help us to know how to, to handle that when the situations arise and that we would be filled with boldness with the Holy Spirit like, um, like the Apostle Paul was and not to let people back us down. But um, also, dear God, um, I just pray that you would please just, just bless everyone that's here tonight. <coughs> help us to have joy. Help us to answer the calling that you have in our life. Help us to know exactly what that is. I mean, you've, you, there's lots of different roles that we can fill in this church and in our lives, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just, just guide us, give us wisdom, give us knowledge, dear Lord. Help us to know exactly what it is that you'd have for us to do. And God, one thing we know for sure, you've called all of us to do is to go out and preach the gospel to every creature, dear Lord. And um, nobody would be going against your will if they were to go out and do that. Dear Lord, it's in Jesus Christ's precious name that we pray. Amen.